Good. 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 All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, from PSD to WordPress theme, bringing designs to life. Uh, if you don't know what a PSD is, you're in the right place. It's okay. Uh, it's a Photoshop docking format. So we're going to be uh, talking about how to take a Photoshop design and and step by step walking through the development of a WordPress theme. Um, this is something that, for me, I, I've attended you know, four or five of these different camps, and this is what I've always wanted to learn. And I've always gone to all the theming presentations hoping that someone would show me this. And uh, no one has, right? It's always like, well, these are the files that you need to technically make a theme. I was like, but I want, I want a pretty theme. So, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, go through all the, the nitty gritty. It's not going to be a live demo. I think live demos have a couple of glitches, but I've taken a ton of screenshots, and I can flip over to the the live stuff if you have questions. So um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Derek Christensen. I have a website, DerekChristensen.com. Um, I read a lot of books. I read about a book a week, and I like to write interesting things there, so please check it out. I, I work full time for Accenture, which is a, an IT consulting company. We have, uh, we're about four times the size of Disney, but nobody's ever heard of us. Um, and but WordPress is something that I love and I love to do on the side. So I have a small freelance company called Media Spine that I do. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, Quora. Uh, you can follow me on GitHub. I don't think I have anything up there right now, but but I will. Uh, a friend of mine approached me with a startup idea, and and I'm a sucker for startups. I love startups, and he said this is going to be amazing and it's going to change the world. Uh, it's going to be. Pandora for local events, right? So you're in Boston and, and you pull up your phone and you see a bunch of events listed and you give them thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs down, and there's a big algorithm in the back end that figures out what, what you like and what you don't. So the next time you pull it up, it's giving you these personalized event recommendations. So it's Friday night, you're sitting around wondering what to do, and, uh, and you just pull out whim and you'll find it right away, personalized for you. And he said, can you build a website for me? I said, sure. And, and we talked about a price. We agreed on a price. And um, he said, I've got a designer that I haven't worked with, but uh, he's supposed to be pretty good. And so this designer is going to send you a comp, and, and then you can build into a website. And I sat there. I was like, OK. Like, I, I can do that, right? Like, I'm the kind of guy I've been. Previously, I'd been buying themes off themeforest.net. And, uh, I would go and just you know tweak this, tweak that, and, and sell it and deliver it, and and that was it. And it worked really well, and uh, people were really happy with it. But I had never done anything from scratch, and so we're going to walk through Wim, the website. Um, so just a couple things as we start, right? Designers are not developers, and that's one thing you got to keep in mind, right? Uh, we love them, but uh, but they're not developers. And stuff that looks great on a poster doesn't always work on the web. So just a little thing to remember. Um, next, so this presentation is really geared to, to people who might be doing this for their first time. So don't try to be super unique. You know, just, just try and follow something that's a little standard and that other people do. Uh, it'll be easier that way when you start out. And back to the designer developer. Uh, Designers need to sit with developers and see see what kind of constraints developers have when they build things. Just like developers need to sit with designers and learn a couple of basic design techniques. So, without further ado, here is the website comp that arrived in my mailbox and someone said, "Build me a WordPress site." Voila. Okay. Now, there's no logo because they didn't have a logo at the time. Um, and, but this is it. So, so I looked at it and I said, uh, "That looks pretty cool." Uh, you know, what, what do I do next? And as I started to analyze the design, I saw a couple things that just popped out at me, and I'm going to bring them up to you to say, you know, how should you analyze a design when you see one? Number one, there are a lot of overlapping design elements. So if we go back here, um, you know, the contact us in the menu overlaps the clouds. That's not really a big deal, but there's an overlap there. This little carrot with a social thing, like, well, what is that? Really? Um, you know, we've got the beautiful Boston skyline down here, but it's, it's overlapped by that available on the iPhone app store. Uh, did we mention it was free image? And 
So, and then we've got the biggest one though, design-wise, is th this iPhone's got a reflection and it looks really, really cool, right? But the, he the, the body is going into the footer and this iPhone is supposed to be a slideshow and, and nobody makes iPhone sliders, right? I've got to learn how to code this myself and I'm not very good at jQuery. So, um, <laughs> so it, it was a lot of learning uh, and that's one consideration. The next one, there's a custom font, which is fine, it's easy to handle, but he didn't include it in the package, right? So, <laughs> so I had to do that. Uh, one tiny thing, right? If you look at the clouds up in the, the right-hand corner, you notice that they're cut in half. So let's say, I mean, this is a normal screen. Let's say this was widescreen, right? My clouds, they've got to stick on that right edge. I can't just have clouds cut in half floating in the middle, right? So those clouds might be way, way, way over from the content on a widescreen thing. Just something to think about. Uh, what else? These little category icons at the bottom. So, so you notice he's got a little mouse over, and, and it changes color when he mouses over. Well, as a designer, he's like, okay, I'm done. But as a developer, I'm like, I've got to incorporate both colors in the website for each icon. So if you're going to have a mouse over effect that's, that's for an image and not for something simple like text, you need to give me the image in, uh, in both colors. I see a couple heads nodding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lastly, as I got into Photoshop and I was digging down, the whole background, he designed it all and then put this like texture over it, which is, which is great, but it's horrible because I can't use that. And um, he also only provided one page. Right? <laughs> I was like, like, there's more than just a home page. Lastly, it wasn't sliced. You know, I thought, I thought I would get this beautiful sliced uh, document, get a folder full of pictures, and I would just throw them up there. And so I emailed him, I said, hey, um, I think you forgot to slice it. Like, can you, can you give me the images, please? And he emailed back and he said, uh, I don't know how to slice. <laughs> so, so if your designer ever tells you that, um, you should fire him and get a new one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I said, yeah, I can learn. I, I like this, I like learning, so I'm going to learn. So. Again, here's what it looks like. We're gonna talk about slicing first. Um, the first step in slicing is identify the unique elements that you wanna slice. You don't have to slice everything, so just figure out what, what it is you want. Uh, the second is you wanna have a transparent background as you slice these things because you don't wanna have like bits of the background color floating around uh, along with the object. Next, you gotta slice it, and then, uh, and then you've got to actually save it out of Photoshop. There's a save for web and devices thing. So I'm going to go into more detail and demo this uh, for you now. Uh, a couple things to remember about slicing. Uh, first, you don't have to slice everything at once, right? Your design's not going everywhere, uh, anywhere. So you might slice parts of it up and parts of it up uh, at different times or in different ways to get different effects, especially if you have overlapping elements, which if you're paying attention, we have. Uh, don't slice text. Right? You can just create text and you can change the font in text. Uh, how do you change the font? I think people have, a couple people have mentioned it already today, but CSS3, there's an at font face uh, um, selector that you can use to use a custom font. It's really, really simple. One cool thing, uh, show of hands, who has heard of CSS sprites? Okay, so it's about half of the room. What it is, is, uh, in something like this image, yeah, all the bullets. I've got all these categories down here, and if I were to load each of them, that's a lot of individual small files. It's much faster for me to uh, load one large file with all of the images, and then uh, there's a there's a thing you do with the code where it says, "Look at this little section of this big image," and that's what I want you to display. So CSS sprites are uh, a really effective way uh, to get lots of small pictures to load quickly on the page. Okay. Uh, next, if you've got an image that appears multiple times, like there's some arrows on either side of the iPhone, you only need one of them and you're going to just repeat it and, uh, and flip it. So, you can also slice by layers, uh, which I'm not going to go into a lot really quickly. Uh, you know, Photoshop has layer after layer after layer after layer. and uh, you can just have it sliced automatically. It's fast, but you've got to do some work on the layers before you can do that, and you don't have as much control. So I'm not really going to go into that, but it's, it's there. So here I've identified the different elements. 
Um, and I'm not going to be slicing all of them like that little text in the middle, but it's an element that I wanted to identify. So now I want to make the background disappear. I want the slices to, to be transparent. So over in Photoshop, as you can see, there's a layers section. And uh, there's a little eyeball. Uh, and if you click on that eyeball next to a layer or a group of layers, what it does is uh, it makes them invisible. So I'm going to click that here, and all of a sudden, I have no more background. It's just the elements I want. So the next step is to slice them. Now, um, oh, you know what? This one didn't fit, so I'm going to have to do that separately. So in Photoshop, you're going to go up to the Slice tool. It's right in the same selector as the Crop tool. Uh, if you need to move from one tool to the other, you right click and then select it. And once you have that tool, you're going to draw slices around all the elements that you want to cut up. Um, these aren't the actual cuts that, that I use, so don't, don't uh, focus too much on those. But you just uh, carefully select the sizes of the images. And, uh, how much extra padding and space around you want. Okay, now I've got all my slices and I want them all to magically turn into images. So I'm going to go to the file menu, save for web and devices. And what happens is I get a pop-up window that shows again all my slices and it has options. A lot of options on the side. And what I can do is go slice by slice by slice. I can do something different for each one if I want it. Um, in this case, I wanted everything to be a, a ping. I wanted that transparent background that you get with a ping. So that's what I selected. Uh, you also give it a title. And then, voila, it pops up in your folder. And the slices are made with numbers. Now, a lot of them are going to be junk and excess that you don't need to use. So you can get rid of them. Um, and then the ones that you do want to use, you're going to give a name that's, that's meaningful that you like. As you can see, I have an example of one of those arrows, and it's a ping, and you can see that the, the background on that is transparent. So, uh, what if you screw up, or you don't like the slices, or you just want to start over? Uh, just go to View, Clear Slices, and you've got a, a clear plate. So, that's the Photoshop part of this, and that's the slicing part of it. Um, and now we're going to move on to building your own thing. A lot of people like to use starter themes or base themes, uh, and, and I'm one of them. I've listed a, a ton on this sheet, and I am searching for the perfect base theme still, and searching for the perfect starter theme still. So if you know of one or you have one, talk to me after, because I would love to know. Um, for this one, I decided to choose the theme Bones. Uh, mostly because he used the 960 grid system, and I, I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. It had you know, some CSS3 and HTML5. So I chose that, and I activated it on a clean install of WordPress on my local uh, computer. And then I decided to make a child theme. So I'm not going to go into the whole parent-child relationship, but basically if you have a child theme, um, you know, you can use all the files in the parent themes, and anything you put in the child theme will overwrite it. Right? So basically, you don't have to create all those files from scratch. You can just uh, count that the parent theme made them, and you can just make your, make your tweaks and changes in development. The only thing you need for a child theme is this little template tag at the bottom of this style.css, and, and you've got one. So these are the two files I created. Uh, one is called uh, frontpage.php, and the other is style.css. So uh, front-page.php is a WordPress standard term. So whenever WordPress sees a file with that name, it knows that it is the front page. There's also a place within the uh, admin panel that you can set that, but uh, sometimes it's nice to do it directly. So here's what I started with as a basis of the code. Uh, some of you in back might not be able to see it, but I have... Uh, PHP get header at the top with PHP get footer at the back. I have a content div in the middle and a bunch of lorem ipsum. And then my, uh, my style.css is empty except for my child theme declaration at the top. So this is what it looks like. I've now activated the Wim child theme. And uh, the sidebar went away and a couple other things, but not much. So now we're going to start building. 
where do you start? Uh, I like to say start with a low hanging fruit, right? Whatever is going to give you the biggest impact uh, with the fastest. So in my case, I'm going to start out with, with the background and the background elements. One thing to remember is there are so many ways to do things. Okay? There are hundreds and thousands of ways to design websites, and everyone thinks one way is better than the other. Uh, as you're learning to do this, don't, don't worry so much about best practices, but instead focus on, on getting it done. Because at the end of the day, if it works, it works. Uh, <laughs> lastly, uh, parent themes come with all these different uh, structures and certain page layouts, and just try and get familiar with that, because it'll make your life easier as you're trying to uh, troubleshoot and also use some of the work that they've already done. So here's, here's the code that I threw, and I came off of uh, WordCamp Boston 2011, and I learned all about CSS3, and I thought it was amazing, and it is. And I decided I wanted to try some of it out. And so I wanted to use the, the new gradients that you can do. Um, and so the top code here is just, it, it's a fallback. It's saying if I'm using IE6 or something that, that can't really handle modern uh, code, then just you know display a little picture and image and tile it across the, the top of the page. But if not, I want you to create a circular uh, gradient with white in the middle and blue on the outside. And uh, and there we go. I don't know if you can. Yeah, you can see the gradient, right? So there it is. So my background is there. Next step, uh, I want to get the bottom in. I want to get the footer in. So I've got to get the footer color, right? In Photoshop. Uh, you pick the little eyedropper, it's kind of like any other design tool, and, and you bring it down. You can't see the eyedropper in this screenshot, but you select what you want, and then you double click on the little tile in the left hand corner, and it will pull up the uh, color picker, and you can see the color. It's pretty basic stuff. There are lots of other ways to, to get them as well. So I implemented that code, and all of a sudden I had my background and I had my footer. Next, I, I noticed that the content was going all the way to the edge. I didn't want it to go all the way to the edge. I wanted to use 960 pixels. And um, so I threw in a little, little content styling just to give it a buffer on the left side and the right side and make it the width that I wanted. Uh, next, I want to do the cloud. You remember, this is the cloud that floats in the upper right-hand corner of the design and always sticks to the right side of the image. Um, this was some cool code that I saw, and I thought I'd try uh, this before selector <laughs> means, means display this element before you display anything else in that element. So I did a body before and, and threw the image in there and, uh, and it worked great. So now I have my clouds. Um, then I wanted the skyline in there. The skyline kind of uh, gives a variety to the background and the footer. So I created a div called the slideshow div, and I threw in the background as uh, the background image as the skyline thing, and I put it in the bottom right. And if you look, there it is. Now one thing you'll notice is the, the text goes right on top of the image, which is not usually what you want uh, unless you have overlapping design elements. Okay? So by making something a background image, it makes it a lot easier for stuff to go over it. Uh, if I put this in the foreground, then things wouldn't be able to go on top of it. Actually, something I did with this site is on this home page, uh, I did have it in the background, and on the rest of the pages, I actually had it as a foreground image because I didn't want the text and the other elements to, to run over. So this is kind of what the HTML markup looks like, more or less. Uh, I've got my content div, and then I have my little slideshow div, and the slideshow div has my skyline in it as the background. And now I'm, I'm ready for the real work. I want my iPhone, I want my little blurb, uh, which is the text, and I need that download from the iTunes App Store button to appear. So um, I'm going to start out with my iPhone, and <coughs> played around, that's the height of the image, played around a little bit with the width, uh, again did, did a background image for this div, and voila, alright, it's looking pretty good and it's coming together. So now my next, uh, my next thing was to add the text in. And one thing that's a little complicated when you're working with uh, two divs inside a wrapper 
is, is if you want them right next to each other, you know, the easiest way to do them is to float them, right? But if you've got two divs that are right next to each other and you float them both, uh, the bigger thing around it, the wrapper, thinks of it as, as invisible, like those divs take up no space. And so sometimes it all collapses. They call it the great collapse. And, uh, and you're sitting there and spending hours trying to troubleshoot. Why won't my divs just go next to each other and, and work really well? So there's, a, there's code that I don't have on the screen, but uh, a lot of people use a class called clearfix. And uh, if you do a, a little command, it's clear, colon, both, it'll, it'll uh, solve that floating div problem for you. So I'm adding the text, and, and it showed up, and it's fairly simple text that I wrote, by the way, because the client didn't really provide me with uh, any text to put on the pages. <laughs> I, found, I found I end up writing a lot of copy in this, in this freelance job. Um, and now I wanted to add in the download image, and it was really simple. I basically wanted it to be exactly like the text above it. Um, and I'm going to use, again, a, a float div. And uh, the same width and everything, I want it to line up and be perfect. And, and I put that on there. So, um, it's really coming together. I mean, it's, it's looking pretty good. It's not exactly like the original, but it's getting there. Now I want to make the, the font a little fancy. So this is the CSS3 font face command. Um, what you do is you go to a, a site like fontsquirrel.com, which has lots of free fonts that you can download and, and use. Uh, so you download a font, put it in your folder with the rest of your website, and this is how you tell something. Uh, this is how you tell the CSS to look at that font and to use that font. And then uh, here in the font family command, uh, <coughs> the text is a little small up here in the back. But the first font that I listed is my custom font, that's Serif BD. And then I'll go ahead and list some other fonts in case they, they don't support CSS three. It'll fall back to Arial or Helvetica or, or Verdana. Um, and you'll notice all of a sudden my font here for the Your Social Event Calendar, right? I'm just going to go back really quickly. This is what it looked like, and that's what it looks like now. So I've implemented that custom font, except for the little carrot and the social thing that was in the comp. I didn't like that part, so, uh, so I didn't implement it. <laughs> that's, that's like when you're a one-man shop, you've got the power to do stuff like that. <laughs> uh, plus, plus he came to me and he's like, you know, I, I definitely want the iPhone to be a slideshow, but could you also make the text a, a slideshow too? So we have the, the two slideshows going, and, and it's one thing to have one slideshow with the comments on the side and a, and a dark background, but when you're doing slideshows with transparent backgrounds, it actually gets really tricky. Um, so I use the, the jQuery uh, cycle for that, and it worked pretty well. Anyway, so I set up the navigation, and again, I tried to use a little bit of CSS3. You can don't have to look at that too closely, but those are those are the navigation settings that were in the parent theme, and I just kind of overwrote them. And if you look now, all of a sudden, my navigation is using that custom font also. And when I highlight it, uh, I'm getting little curvy corners, and that's all done by CSS3. So I don't have an image, I don't have any kind of round image doing that. That's just done automatically in the browser. This is what it looks like right now. So these are the files that I have in my, in my theme folder. A lot of themes should be organized. You can have like an images thing and a scripts folder and, and stuff like that. But I wanted to keep this really simple and really flat. So that's how they're organized. And I decided it was time to include a header.php and start, start editing that. So I pulled it out. Um, this is straight from the parent theme. And, uh, and I took that and decided to start doing a little bit of styling. So I took the, the header as a banner and I gave it a width again to constrain it to that 960 pixels. And, uh, and you'll notice it looks just the same as the last screenshot except those the home and sample page. Those scoot it in to the right a little bit. And you'll also notice something else happened, which is the clouds. The clouds are overlapping the text, right? Uh, there are a couple ways to solve that. Uh, I didn't worry about it too much at this point because I knew my logo was still missing and some other things were missing. And actually, by putting those in, it solved the problem. But if you do have things that are overlapping in the wrong order, there's a CSS element called the Z index, which tells you what you know what level should I put things and, and how should they display. 
So, um, I wanted to move that navigation, which is over on the left, to be over on the right, and I wanted to add in the logo. Okay. So, here we go. I have a, a, my little navigation, very simple, floating to the right. Uh, and then here is my HTML that I'm using to, to add the logo in. Again, it's very basic. It's just uh, replacing what was already in the theme and telling me where to grab my logo. And lastly, I gave a little bit of styling to the logo. And voila. All right? So, so it all came together uh, really pretty well. And just as you're remembering it from the comp, it probably looks exactly like the comp did. Let's do a let's do a little comparison, right? So, so it's a little different. Okay, we have, we have a couple changes. Number one, I haven't put the categories on yet. I, I decided not to do that for this demo. But um, a few things I decided not to do. I left. I dropped the arrows on the left and the right because uh, they just weren't necessary. You know, within the slideshow that I built, you can hover on it and it'll pause and then. Uh, if you move your mouse, it'll go back and forth. There are only like four slides, so I didn't really need it. Uh, again, I dropped a social with a carrot because making that a slideshow, it just seemed um, seemed like something you could do, but you really didn't want to do if you're having a text work as a slideshow. Uh, and other than that, I also didn't do the mouse over thing at the bottom of the active lifestyle. Um, we decided to actually make a categories page instead, and so that's what we ended up doing. This is what the final site looks like online, uh, and it is online at wimap.com. And you'll notice that the, the categories, there are a lot more categories than they used to be. So uh, we added a bunch of those and added a couple more web pages that you can see in the bottom left. So um, that, was, that, that was the process, and I know I whizzed through that fairly quickly, but I hope you saw how easy it is to to take a design document, cut it up, and then just start with the big elements and try to put them into place, and then little by little uh, put the small elements into place. It's not easy, and it takes a lot of time, uh, a lot of googling, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of fixing and iterations and, and troubleshooting. But it's an amazing process to learn, and it's one that will make you a better designer and a developer. So now I wanted to go through a couple of the tools that I use to do it and some alternative tools uh, if you would like to do something like this. So for my text editor, I use eText Editor, which is like TextMate, uh, which is a Mac program, but on Windows. It uh, has these bundles that were kind of like a, an IDE where you'll type something and it'll predictably know what you're going to type next and give you all the options and can save you a lot of time. Um, <coughs> XAMPP, uh, if you were in the last session here, it's a local development environment that uh, has Apache, PHP, MySQL, and, and allows you to build the actual site on your local computer instead of building it online somewhere. Um, it's, it's really not that hard to set up, and it's pretty cool. Adobe Photoshop, if you don't have it, uh, you can use GIMP, which is an open source free alternative. And Adobe Illustrator, also if you don't have it, you can use Inkscape, an open source free alternative. Lastly, one of the most critical things that I used was uh, Firebug for Firefox. And that's a tool that you'll, you'll select an element and it'll show you all the styling that's being applied and all the, all the styling and theming that's being overwritten. So those are some really essential tools. <coughs> Uh, and then we have some web resources. So my slides are all online at slideshare.net slash Derek DAC. Uh, they are fairly recent. It's not quite the most recent version, but I will be uploading that later today. CSS3, please, is a great, uh, cool site that shows you lots of ways uh, to use the new CSS3 technologies. And the great thing is you edit it on the site, and, and it'll show you what you changed. CSSTricks.com is by far the, the best CSS uh, explanation website that I've encountered. Uh, if you're having a trouble, uh, having trouble figuring something out or fixing a problem, this is really the place to go. Um, NetTuts always has uh, some. They actually have some really good Photoshop tutorials and good Adobe Illustrator tutorials if you're trying to figure that out and struggling with some of the basic commands. Um, I hate Photoshop. 
Uh, I thought I'd wait till the end to say that, but it is the most unintuitive tool that I've ever used. Um, whereas Illustrator, I think, is brilliant, and I can do anything I want automatically. Uh, and, and my wife is more of a designer, and she thinks the exact opposite. But, uh, you know, Photoshop, I end up having to Google just about every single thing I want to do in Photoshop. <laughs> I, and so it's, it's good to know that we have resources out there. StackExchange.com or StackOverflow.com. That's a question and answer site where the community goes in and it's a community of coders and it's a really amazing and talented community. And you'll post a question and someone will look at it and, and tell you exactly what you're doing wrong and you can fix it. But uh, most of the time somebody's already done that. Um, yeah. Question about, I saw earlier you mentioned the uh, that font squirrel site. Uh -huh. So basically you can if you don't if you're not using like one of the standard web fonts you can like download a TTF file and then upload it and use it or is yeah it depends on so the fonts come with different licenses yeah but essentially yeah you go to one of those and you'll find a font and depending on the license it has you can just upload it to your server use some really 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 simple basic CSS and then that font that custom font whatever you want will be applied to your whole website so you would have to convert it to a graphic file. Correct, yeah, and, and that saves a lot of space. Uh, pages load a lot more quickly. Yeah. You know, okay. The old way of doing it was, was with Kufan, which was the JavaScript thing, and, and that was a little more complex, but this, it couldn't be easier. Yeah. So, oh, and by, by the way, I don't, yeah. I don't use uh, Photoshop e either. I use uh, PaintShop Pro. PaintShop Pro, <laughs> okay, so we got PaintShop Pro as another option. Um, those are the web resources. I'm gonna open up to questions now. Again, the URL for the slides is online. Feel free to check them. Um, if you have a question, just go ahead and walk up to the microphone. They wanted to get everything on the mic so that we can hear it in the recording. So does the Photoshop file that you started with, does it have to be a certain, like the actual pixel width of the page? So you started with like 960. Was that Photoshop comp? Was that, in, was that the exact size or did you have to resize it? How does that work? Great question. Um, the designer did start with a standard, oh, uh, with a standard kind of website size, and so I didn't have to do a lot of resizing. But what you'll notice is that I did, I didn't use his widths on either side. I created a background image that can be as wide or as narrow as need to be. But yeah, when you're designing, you want to start with a, a standard web template in that design. Some people will also argue that you want to you want to design for mobile first and then move up to a, to a tablet and to a full website. Um, I think for you know, this audience and for what we're talking about here, you just want to get a website up and running, right? So, uh, so just design it for a normal size monitor. Can I speak very loudly? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. I'll, I'll repeat the question. So you started with a parent theme that looks to be very similar thing. When you were showing your CSS, you weren't overwriting very much of it, like going in and having to undo some of the styles or overwrite some of the styles. Mm -hmm. So do you have to start with a parent theme in WordPress? Is that, like you don't just create your own parent theme? Uh, no, uh, you can, a lot of people do create their own parent theme and you don't have to. Uh, using a parent theme is a good way to, to not reinvent the wheel. Oh, did I, did I repeat that question? So the question was, do you have to use a parent theme or can you just, uh, and make a child theme, or can you just create your own theme? And and you can create your own theme. The reason they use a starter theme or a base theme is that somebody's gone through and thought of common issues that everyone's going to have in a browser or uh, with layouts, and they've tried to give you a base in a place where you can start and just just it's a launch pad really for you to build your theme. Um, I ended up choosing this starter theme that was Bones uh, was the name of it, and you know midway through the project the developer released a new version. And the whole point of doing a child theme is then you can upgrade the parent theme and get more you know, settings and features and security. And uh, it totally broke my child theme. Uh, he, he didn't make it backward compatible and it totally broke it. And I was like, man, I should have just changed his theme to begin with. Why did I do that? So, um, so I'm not going to use that theme again. But uh, <laughs> does, does that kind of answer your question about why you would use a starter theme or a base theme? So you, you, you found that with a simpler skeleton theme, you didn't have to do a lot of unstyling to get what you wanted. It was as simple as what you showed us. Yeah, so the question was, uh, did I find that with a simpler skeleton theme, yeah, I didn't have to do as much unstyling? That's exactly right. Uh, if you take uh, more built-out themes or uh, you know even the WordPress 
people, themes. Uh, there's a lot of unstyling that you need to do. So you can go at starter themes like uh, Starkers, for example, is one that has almost no styling whatsoever. And I wanted just a little more than that to go off of, so I went somewhere in the middle. But a lot of people prefer to start with absolutely nothing. Yes? I'll, I'll do the same. So your, your front page PHP that you created didn't seem to have any PHP or any logic in it. And so the comment was, my front page PHP didn't have any PHP or logic in it. Uh, that is absolutely correct, 100% so correct. So the content of your front page was hard coded into that? Uh, yes, file. it was. Yes, it was. And uh, the files that I showed up there are not 100% the files that I actually used on the live site. Uh, I wanted to make it something that was a little more digestible. But yeah, there wasn't dynamic content on the front page that wasn't, uh, wasn't a requirement from the client, and so we ended up putting uh, you know, all the different slides and things right in there. A good observation. Uh, yes, in the back. I'm familiar with in HTML how you link to a CSS file, for example. Um, in WordPress for the theme, once you install the theme, but you want to add your child theme in your own CSS, you link to the CSS in, with the theme, or do you install it in a folder that it so let me try and summarize the question. Uh, if, you know, in a normal HTML page, it's easy to link to the styles.css. So when you are in WordPress and you're using a parent in child theme, you know, how do you actually link to, to uh, your style sheet? Um, the answer is parent child themes, uh, it'll load both style sheets, and so you'll have one style sheet in the parent theme folder that's normal, and you'll have a, and it'll be called style.css, and then you have another theme, uh, another style.css in your theme folder. Um, there are a few different commands to, to say get the style sheet that's in the parent folder versus get the style sheet that's, that's in my custom folder, but the general function of WordPress is to use the style sheet that is in your custom folder. Anything that's in there just automatically overrides what's in the parent folder. Uh, yes. Yes, you. Um, when I do a lot like from Photoshop to um, WordPress, um, my, one of my big problems is that I don't know how to translate fully the drop shadow and the inner glow and all the effects and, you know, so his comment was, uh, in Photoshop and things, you can design a lot of stuff with drop shadow and cool effects. And how do you take that and uh, and convert it into a WordPress theme? I think if you're wanting to do cool effects in drop shadow, check out CSS3. CSS3 has some cool drop shadow abilities and capabilities that you might want to use. Uh, and in some cases, if the effects are tricky enough, uh, you'll just want to slice it and use it as an image and, and put that image in there. All right, I, I had a question right up here in the front. Um, how did you deal with your subsequent pages? You got a great, did you use Photoshop to create the, uh, the page that the blog entries are on and the data entries are on? That's a great question. So the question was, how did I deal with the subsequent pages? Uh, the person gave me a front page. What did I do with the rest? Most of the styling that I did affected the, the, the structure. I mean, it was, it was a lot of work in the CSS. And so as long as the subsequent pages had that same, uh, those same elements in the HTML, a content area and uh, you know, different areas like that, a lot of the styling carried right over to the other pages. Um, I did do some custom styling on those. I did not mock it up in Photoshop. I had enough of a basis with this to, to just fill in the rest of the content. And you can check it out at, at wimapp.com and, and see some more of that. Uh, yes, sir. So um, if you take a look at your initial mock-up in, in uh, Photoshop, which looks pretty darn good, um, moving that over to, uh, to WordPress, why did you make so many slices? Why couldn't you just have taken a good portion of it as just one image and put it in place um, and then only slice where you needed individual items to then click on? It's a good question. So the question was, uh, I had this, this you know, beautiful comp in Photoshop. Why did I slice it into such small pieces instead of slicing it into a bigger piece? And the answer to that is, uh, the quick answer is load time. 
Um, if I have a really, really, really big image, it just takes a long time to load. And wherever I can, instead of having a large image load, I would rather have it be a, a background color that the browser can generate automatically and instantaneously, or text, again, that the browser can, can generate really quickly. So images, just slow down your page time. Yes? Um, going into some of the load times, um, I noticed you also used a font that was not a, a base font on the server, per se. Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between, say, using like the Google CDN for fonts versus uploading your own fonts as far as load times and what it does to your server? Okay, so the question is, I, I took this font, this custom font that we use with FontFace, and I put it on my own server and use it. But uh, Google also has kind of a, an area where they have a, a lot of fonts available, right? And you can reference that instead. The answer is it's a lot faster to use Google. Use Google. Um, same with, with jQuery and things like that. If, if it's a library that Google has, their server is going to be faster than your server. And they've got it all cached. And so um, if you can find it on Google, use it on Google. All right, uh, last question. Well, two more. Two more, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you first. Mine's not really a question, but just in response. I turned around to see who it was and asked about the gradients and CSS three properties. Um, you might want to take a look at Adobe Fireworks. The new CS6 version of Fireworks. You design your gradient, you design your rounded corners, and it will tell you what the CSS is. So it was a recommendation for if you want cool effects and things like that uh, that you can make through CSS3, use Adobe Fireworks because it's it's powerful and it has a lot of tools for that. Yes, sir. My question, you'll end up, should I talk? I don't know. Yeah, uh, talk in the microphone. Please. Yeah. Why not? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Your, cu your customer asked, gave you a comp of what they wanted, and I, I see that I understand this, but um, you did, you looked at it and you made some like the rollovers for the double graphics and all the things. You decided you didn't like those, or the, even the carrot thing, you didn't like it, so you didn't do it. Sometimes your client, it, it worked better. You gave them something better, which is yes, but, but sometimes they just want what they gave you, and it's close, but it's not what they asked for. You become Dr. No. You didn't. You don't say yes. You're saying, "Here's what I think I'll do for what you asked for." Do you ever have problems with that? Is it? Um, in this case, uh, I mean, that's a very good question. In this case, you know, the designer was completely non-responsive. You know, he, he handed it over and he dropped <laughs> off the face of the world. So, so I wasn't going really back and forth with the designer who had done a lot. I was going back and forth with uh, with the client who wanted it done, and he was less. Uh, he didn't care as much about the design specifics. So in this case, it wasn't a problem at all, and I don't even think he noticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's time to wrap up.